This episode contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, which may be disturbing to some listeners. There are many untold stories about the dedication and bravery of our nation's police officers, and we'll be bringing you some of those stories throughout the season in a series called APB Behind the Badge. Today, we're bringing you the first special Behind the Badge episode. This story takes us back more than a half century in a small city in upstate New York a one-night crime spree that devastates three communities and forever changes the lives of those unfortunate enough to have found themselves in the path of a cold-blooded gunman. This is APB Behind the Badge. Here's your host, former police chief Mark Spahn. At 9.30 p.m. on September 8, 1969, a customer pulls up to the gas pumps at Finn Service Station in the village of Canastota, New York. The 28-year-old attendant dashes out to greet the man and starts pumping gas into his 1963 Ford. He makes a quick inspection of the tires and asks the customer if he wants his oil checked. The man pays for his gas, gets change, and leaves the station. Jim Zofi is a former chief of police in Canastota. He looked up the old files for us. The attendant would have been Paul George at the time. As Paul was watching the station, he saw that vehicle that he had just pumped gas in return, got out of his car, approached Paul outside of the station, and asked that he he didn't give him the right amount of change. The customer directs Paul inside the station and suddenly draws a gun, demanding all of the money. Paul complies, handing over about $500. The gunman then forces Paul back outside and behind the station telling him to hand over his wallet. Fearing he'll be shot and left for dead, Paul again complies. At that moment, another car pulls into the station, causing the gunman to flee. Paul immediately calls Canastota police. With a description of the robber in his car, police broadcast the information across two counties, including the last known direction of travel, which put the suspect on a trajectory for Cheryl. It's a small community with tree-lined streets, where everyone knows each other. Sergeant Wayne Costin was the police dispatcher that night back in 1969. 9.30, we got a call from the Canastota police on the radio that the Finn gas station had just been held up. A white man and the gentleman was driving east in a blue Ford car. The lone officer on duty that night at the Sherrill PD was part-time police officer Bob Mumford. It began as an uneventful night for the officer. Then, he hears the radio broadcast and sets up on Route 5, the main road between Canastota and Sherrill. And if the robber is heading east, he should be heading right toward Officer Mumford. It's 9.48 p.m., 18 minutes after the holdup and about 10 miles from the crime scene, when Officer Mumford spots a car matching the description and calls it in. The police chief, Tom Riley, is notified from home by the dispatcher, and he heads over to join Officer Mumford, who now has the car stopped. The driver acts surprised that the police would be stopping him, and there's conversation between the driver, Martin Fitzpatrick, Officer Mumford, and Chief Riley. Riley radios in at 9.54 that the man they're talking with is cooperative. As the officers talk with Fitzpatrick, the police activity has drawn the attention of some young men hanging out at the corner gas station across the street. One of them is 23-year-old Bruce Rochester, who's working the 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. shift. It was interesting, the 6 to 10 shift at the gas station, because it wasn't that, certainly there wasn't a lot of mechanical work, mostly pumping gas and stuff, and all of my friends would stop by because we're all into cars. So I would have been, you know, manning the gas pumps and talking to my friends. We just were in the office talking, and... We saw the police car stop another car across the street on Route 5. You don't pay a lot of attention to that, but you were aware of it. And then I believe a second police car showed up. Also watching nearby is Dennis Fogg, who knows Officer Mumford and Chief Riley. Dennis was 18 years old at the time. I was watching another car come up, which was Tom Riley, who was the chief of police here in Cheryl. And he got out, and both Bob and Tom got talking to this guy. And they talked for a few minutes, and uh, 
the guy went back to his car, and Bob and Tom followed him. The officer spoke with the driver, Martin Fitzpatrick, who was cooperative and apparently providing a convincing account of why he was mistaken for someone else. Chief Riley seemed somewhat convinced of the story and radioed to the dispatcher that he thought he had the wrong guy, but he recorded Fitzpatrick's name and license plate number in his notebook anyway. Nonetheless, a Canastota PD car was already en route to Cheryl with Mr. DeGeorge, the gas station victim, for a show-up. Now, while lineups are sometimes conducted using six similar-looking subjects, show-ups are a permissible practice in the field when it's conducted soon after the commission of an offense, close in time, close to the crime. Fitzpatrick likely knew that he was about to face his robbery victim soon, whether being informed by the officers or hearing their radio transmissions. At 9.58 p.m., four minutes after Chief Riley's last radio call, the man they were questioning pulls a gun, and before either of the officers can react, he shoots both Officer Bob Mumford and Chief Tom Riley. Bruce Rochester was speaking with his stepfather, John Orr, out in front of the gas station. And we were talking about the gas pumps, and we heard gunshots, you know, pop, 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 like that. And I didn't know what that was all about, but my stepfather was right on top of it. And he just put the blazer in drive and did a 180 and roared out of the gas station and turned right and went up Route 5 to chase this guy because after the gunshots, the car that had been stopped pulled away very quickly. So I ran across the street and Officer Mumford was leaning against his car, just completely stunned look on his face, holding his chest, color drained from his face. And I turned around and Chief Riley was on his knees leaning into his car with the door open, talking on a two-way radio with the headquarters. And I heard him say, please hurry. Again, here's police dispatcher Wayne Coston. No, it's 9.58. That's when Chief Riley radioed that he'd been shot. I've lived with it for 50 years and can never get Tom's voice out of my mind. I can hear it today. I'm shot, I'm shot. God help me, I'm shot. Never forgot that. Ambulances and backup units head to the scene as Fitzpatrick tore off. And even though an eyewitness, John Orr, was racing after the shooter, Fitzpatrick disappeared into the darkness. One of the responding officers that night was 30-year-old Sheriff's Deputy Fran Broski, and after more than 50 years, he remembers it like it was yesterday. I received a call to respond to Route 5 Cheryl. Two Cheryl police officers are down, and I responded to the uh, scene on Route 5 and found numerous police vehicles and ambulances there. And I got out of the car, talked to the officers there, and they advised me what happened. And the car the, the suspect was driving, and I drove to Kirkland and checking for the car. And I turned off some of the uh, county roads and checked the side roads. Dozens of police cars from several agencies descend on the scene. Officers are responding from Oneida in Madison counties. State troopers, Vernon, Oneida, and Canastota police. Some are securing the scene of the shooting, while others frantically search for the suspect and his car. Word travels fast in the small community, affectionately called Mayberry by some of its residents. But now, there's two bloodied police cars sitting along the side of the road. News reaches the families of the injured officers who have been rushed by ambulance to the local hospital. By this time, the suspect is racing out of town, looking for a spot to dump his car. He finds himself on a dark country road about 10 miles outside of Cheryl. It's around 10.30 that night when he sees a home with a car in the driveway. Inside is Marie Delapi Nordberg. Her two little girls are asleep in their beds. Marie's been talking on the telephone with her sister, who's been listening to the police scanner, and they're talking about all of the activity going on in Cheryl not realizing that two cops had been shot. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door, and Marie tells her sister she's got to go. So I said, Betty, I can't talk right now. I'll call you back. So I went to the door, 
and there's this guy standing there. So he asked me for directions to Syracuse. Marie was just 26 years old at the time. It's late. She's alone in her rural home with her two young girls, Jody, age six, and Debbie, age four. And a strange man is at her door. He says, can I have a glass of water? And I said, no. Now I had the, both doors had been locked. The inside door was locked and the, the screen door was locked. He said, I just want a glass of water. And I said, no. And he grabbed the door and it just sort of bent, buckled, and in he comes. And here he is with this great big gun pointing at my head. And I looked at him and I thought, this is for real. He's forced his way inside, gun in hand. He tears the telephone from the wall and checks the rest of the house, finding that it's only Marie and her two daughters asleep in the bedroom. So he tells the young mother that she is going to drive him to Syracuse. He figures the appearance of a family driving together on a Monday night would be to his advantage in case they were stopped by police. At gunpoint, a terrified Marie puts her sleeping children into the back seat and follows orders to get behind the wheel and drive. Fitzpatrick rides in the passenger seat holding his gun. Marie is desperate. For her, it's a balancing act, keeping her kids safe and trying to placate the armed kidnapper. We were going along and he says, the cops are going to be looking for me. So I figured that he had robbed somebody or something like that. So we're driving along, we were listening to the radio. The news came on in a, a, a news flash and said something about the two police officers and Cheryl being shot at. At the same time Marie and her kidnapper are driving towards Syracuse, Marie's sister, who was waiting for Marie to call her back, became worried, and she and her husband go to Marie's home finding no one there. And most disturbing, her car is gone. And the car sitting in the driveway is the same one police were looking for. Meanwhile, Marie Nordberg is still following the instructions of her abductor. She remembers being in a desolate spot of roadway a few miles outside of Syracuse. And she wonders what this desperate man might do. And all of a sudden we're at a place where it's very dark, no, no street lights, Trees on both sides, a drop off to, to the right. And I thought, okay, if something's gonna happen, it's gonna happen right here. And my heart must have been beating a million miles an hour because I thought he could kill us, throw us over the ditch, take my car, or even throw us over the ditch with the car. And nobody would find us for a long time. It's been a long nerve wracking journey for Marie. And they're now in the city of Syracuse. The kidnapper tells Marie, we're almost there. So we drove down to the end of the street and memorized the name of the store that was there. It was on Salina Street. It's around midnight, and Marie is praying that Fitzpatrick just gets out of her car and doesn't hurt her and the girls. So we didn't go very far after that, and he asked me to pull over. So he gets out of the car, and he closes the door, and he says, my friend and I are going to follow you and make sure that you, that you leave Syracuse. So then I thought, okay, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. After the kidnapper exits the car, Marie pulls away. She doesn't see him following her, but she's still concerned. And Debbie from the back seat says, Mom, are our windows bulletproof? And I thought at that time that they were both asleep. I knew Jody fell asleep most of the way, but I didn't realize that Debbie was still awake at that time. And I said, no, they're not, honey. I said, stay down. I said, you need to stay down. So we drove down to the end of the street. I see a policeman walking down the road. So I stopped and told him what was going on. There was a call, call box there. He called the Syracuse police station. And turns out he was a night watchman for some company. But I don't know what the guy's name is. I wish I did, because I would thank him again. And he was very, very nice to us. He told me to get down, told the kids to stay down. And he stood outside my car with his gun drawn until the Syracuse police finally got there. Sensing a major break in the case, state police investigators rushed to Syracuse PD to meet with Marie Nordberg. They need to glean every bit of information possible from Marie to stop this violent man. Back at the hospital in Oneida, Chief Riley tells investigators about the suspect. He describes him as smooth and a good talker. The chief is an excellent witness, providing details about the stop and the shooter. Investigators begin putting the pieces together. 
The chief's daughter, Marianne Riley Gardner, is at the hospital with her dad. He had an incredible skill for reading people. Almost always he was right on. The only time he wasn't was Martin Fitzpatrick. He thought he had the wrong man. He stopped him, and he really believed he had the wrong man. He was going to let him go. And Martin Fitzpatrick walked to his car and got his gun and turned around and just started shooting. Riley told investigators that after he was shot and fell to the pavement, the man grabbed Riley's gun from his holster and dropped it on the ground. Crime scene photos from that night show the chief's revolver laying on the road not far from the police car with live rounds of ammunition scattered on the ground. Throughout the early morning hours of September 9, 1969, police are at the scene of the shooting and investigators are still talking with Marie Nordberg at Syracuse PD. Another team of investigators are at Marie's home where they find the telephone ripped from the wall and the suspect's car in the driveway. Joanne Mumford is Bob Mumford's daughter-in-law. She arrives at the hospital with other family members. There were policemen lined up outside donating blood because I guess he was shot up so bad they couldn't, they couldn't stop the bleeding. And uh, I remember waiting and waiting, and then I remember his doctor coming down and saying, he's gone. Why such a wonderful man had to go in such a horrible way. Chief Riley is in critical condition with bullets still in his body. His daughter Marianne is with him at the hospital when she tells him that Bob didn't make it. This fellow came and he told me that your dad's been shot, that was all. And we did go to the emergency room immediately. But when I got there, they told me that Bob Mumford had passed away. There was not too much to say. He was in a lot of pain. He was snowy white and very sweaty. And he asked me about Bob. How's Bob doing? And I said, Bob passed away. And he cried. But Chief Riley, the consummate professional, knows there's a dragnet out for the suspect. And even though he was shot twice, critically injured, he refuses pain medication. He wanted to make sure that his state of mind could not be challenged later when he gave his statement or identified the suspect. Again, the chief's daughter, Marianne Riley Gardner. He said, if I'm going to identify this man, if they're going to bring him in here, I can't have any pain medication. And I'll tell you that I really did not know how extensive his injuries were. I honestly didn't. But he said, I can't take anything. I've got to wait. I've got to wait. And that's what he was waiting for, was for them to capture this fellow and bring him back so he could identify him. Up in Syracuse, Marie Nordberg has been sharing the details of her harrowing ordeal to police. At the same time, back in Cheryl, investigators at the scene of the shooting find an entry in Chief Riley's notebook with a license plate number which matches a DMV registration card also dropped at the scene. The car is owned by a woman known to associate with Martin Fitzpatrick, and he's now at the top of New York State's most wanted list. A team of police went to Fitzpatrick's apartment that morning and found him hiding in a closet. He still had some of the cash from the holdup and the gun used to shoot both officers. About 12 hours after the shooting, Martin Fitzpatrick's brought to Chief Riley's hospital room in Oneida. The chief says, that's him, that's him, that's him. Chief Riley has done his job. He finally allowed the doctors to give him pain medication, and he could now focus on his own recovery. Fitzpatrick is charged with the murder of Officer Mumford. Chief Riley fought to recover for several days, but tragically, on September 13th, Five days after he was shot, he succumbed to his injuries. In this beautiful, quaint city of Cheryl, everyone knew each other. The police were not just a part of local government, they were neighbors, friends. Debbie Mumford Kemp has fond memories of her grandfather, Bob Mumford, and she shared with us how the shooting impacted the entire community. Cheryl was a place you could go and not lock your doors and feel safe 
the world came crashing down. I was very close to my grandpa and grandma. I spent a lot of time with them. And my grandfather was bigger than life. He was tall, as mom said, a, a gentle giant. And when mom came in and said, grandpa has died, you couldn't comprehend it. And as 12 years old, nothing like this had ever happened in this community. And I lost my grandpa when my grandfather was murdered. The whole city of Cheryl and beyond rallied around my family and gave us such support and love. And it affected everybody, not just us. I think any police officer, state trooper, sheriff was impacted by this. Such a sense of loss. For Bruce Rochester, the 23-year-old eyewitness from the gas station in Cheryl, the tragedy is as vivid today as it was more than 50 years ago. It was a, an, an event you don't talk about much, but you certainly don't um, forget about it. In fact, I talked about the fact that you were coming to town and that I, <clears throat> I was a witness to all this, and most of my friends didn't know that. The funerals for Officer Mumford and Chief Riley were attended by family, friends, residents of the city, and hundreds of law enforcement officers. They were eulogized and remembered for their service and their sacrifice to the community they loved. Again, here's Officer Mumford's granddaughter, Debbie Kemp. I can remember the whole day of the funeral going to the church and there was a sea of blue and black uniforms and state troopers everywhere and then coming over to the park where it's now uh, the Riley Mumford Memorial Park. It was packed with people from Cheryl, police officers, state troopers, sheriffs. It was such a representation of how dear and precious their lives were. Kidnap victim Marie Nordberg's youngest daughter, Kimberly, wasn't born when all this happened, but she knows the details of what her mom and two older sisters went through in 1969. And that gives her a special perspective on how she and her family view the police. Here's Kimberly Allen. There was an incredible loss, and they sacrificed their lives to protect us. And I think for people who have been through a situation like this, we look at a police officer differently. When I see a police officer on duty, I know he or she is putting themselves at risk every single day. And it can take one moment and one person to take away their life. And even though Marie's daughter Jody doesn't remember her kidnapping, she knows that the actions of her mom saved their lives. Well, my mom is my hero. I mean, she held that all together her whole life. Debbie and I knew what had happened to us, and, you know, the police officers had been shot and that we had been kidnapped when we were young. But we never really talked about it, and we never had details, or she never burdened us with her issues and what she was dealing with. And we never heard her story until maybe six or seven years ago when there was a story done by a gentleman in Canastota. The tight-knit community of Cheryl, New York, still remembers their heroes more than a half century later. Here's Joanne Mumford. Every year over where I go to church to St. Helena's, they have a mass for Bob and Tom. The closest date on a Saturday or Sunday to September 9th. You'll remember Fran Broski, one of the sheriff's deputies who responded to the officer's down call in 1969. He retired from the sheriff's office and went on to serve as a chief of police for the city of Cheryl. Now retired, he will always remember his friends, Bob and Tom. Well, on duty on several occasions, uh, on patrol, I was stopping and visit with Chief Riley or Mumford, and living on the streets of Cheryl, they'd stop and visit with me, and we were like friends. It's like losing two brothers. I lost two good police officers, and We'll never get over it. Like when I drive by the location, I have a flashback. 
I'll never forget him. We don't always know the impact we make on people. The murders of Chief Riley and Bob Mumford had a profound impact on the life of a young man in the nearby city of Oneida, New York. Tom Riley was a frequent customer at the automotive store where Doug Bailey worked as a teenager, and he remembered when Chief Riley would come into the store. 1969, I was an employee at 22 years old at a store in downtown city of Oneida, New York, which is probably five miles from Sherrill. Once a week, Tom Riley would come in the store, who at times would talk about police work, never trying to enlist me uh, because I had no desire to be a police officer. That was not part of what I wanted to do at 22 years old. I still didn't know what I wanted, but police work wasn't part of it. When they got shot, the sadness was there, but it turned to anger. That was in 1969. And in 1970, I took my first police officer exam. And within probably 13, 14 months, I was wearing a gun and a badge, too. It was just such a loss from that gentleman that I knew was Tom Riley and how someone can do that. To this day, I, I, I can't explain fully how I ended up taking a police exam other than, other than what little bit I knew of Tom Riley. He influenced me. He was a compassionate guy, and my anger uh, upon some guy with a gun taking his life turned to determination, and my determination was to become a police officer. I would like to think that he would be proud of me. You know, he, he was a huge influence. I wish I had the opportunity to, to thank Tom Riley for the influence he gave me, and maybe someday. Again, here's Chief Riley's daughter, Marianne Gardner. I'm sure at the end, my dad knew he was not going to survive. He was a lawman. <laughs> he really and truly, he lived it. He believed it. He believed you follow the rules. If you don't follow the rules, there's no sense in having them. What would his legacy be? If people hear the story and recognize that happened right here, respect and maybe a little dignity. That's what I would think. Dignity for the profession, because you hear so many bad things. Maybe you need to hear that somebody was honestly pure, good, a decent man. Officer Bob Mumford and Chief Tom Riley are still remembered today as honest and decent men heroic in their sacrifice to the community they loved. The city park named in their honor is a popular hub for all sorts of activities in the area. It's a fitting tribute, a place where people can celebrate, enjoy, and reflect by the monument that stands in their honor. Martin Fitzpatrick's trial was held the following year, in November 1970. He was found guilty. Murder of a police officer at that time carried the death penalty, and Fitzpatrick's execution date was set for February 1971. But the state's highest court later ruled the death penalty unconstitutional, and Fitzpatrick was resentenced to 50 years. He died in prison in 2007. We hope you enjoyed this special episode of APB Behind the Badge on APB Cold Case. For photos and information, visit our website at apbcoldcase.com. We'd like to give special thanks to the Paul DeGeorge family, Marie DeLoppe Nordberg, Kimberly Allen, Jody DeLoppe, and Debbie Wazinski, Joanne Mumford, Debbie Kemp, and Marianne Riley Gardner, Bruce Rochester and Dennis Fogg, former police officers Sergeant Wayne Coston, Under Sheriff Doug Bailey, Chief Fran Broski, Chief Jim Zofi, and to the Oneida, Canastota, and Sherrill Police Departments, the City of Sherrill, Peter Finnecaro, the family of Leo Rafty, and a special thanks to our production assistant, Laura Jaquez. You're listening to APB Behind the Batch, an original Spawn Group production. Send your comments to APB Behind the Batch at spawngroup.com.